I thought I was being invited here because I had written this novel, so I, <laughs> I kind of prepared um, a reading from that. Um, I have been an academic administrator uh, for a lot of time. Is, is there anyone who's actually a professor? Is there anyone who's been an administrator as a professor? Mm. Horrible. <laughs> Just horrible. So um, when, I was, when, I was, when I was at the deepest point of, of administering, I, I would sometimes find myself walking in the forest, and somebody would be talking to me. And I, I, you know, I, you begin to say one that, you say, you know, who is that? What, what is that? What's going on? Am I losing my mind? And I, I knew I wasn't losing my mind, and then I very quickly began to realize that the person talking to me was the wife of D.H. Lawrence, who I had worked on at the beginning of my career, and, and hadn't really worked on much since at all, and it was really very strange. So I began to explore that, and um, uh, a lot of you want to be novelists, and one of the cliches about writing novels is that sometimes the words are writing, and you're not really writing them. And that was what was happening to me with this book. And, and this woman, who's Frida Lawrence, is who I realized it was, was talking to me, but only when I was on vacation. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. I'm serious. I, I would be administering my little heart out and having, you know, having sleepless nights. And then I would, I would sit down at my desk when I was on vacation, and 50 pages. <laughs> and then it was amazing, and, and I didn't really feel I was writing it. Um, so, um, I, 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 I've published it, and, and, and here it is, and uh, I always feel a little reticent, and I, I, when I'm reading my academic prose, I feel like I'm on a level playing field, but when I'm reading my fiction, I don't know if I'm on a level playing field, so I ask your indulgence and, and your, your charity. Uh, but what made me go ahead and publish this, um, I was working on it, and then I'd be on sabbatical, and I'd pull it out, and I'd work on it again, and, and so on and so forth. And then I finally published it because um, Hilary Mantel was doing so beautifully. And while I didn't think I was Hilary Mantel, I was aware that Hilary Mantel was not Hilary Mantel uh, when she started. Um, and then The Paris Wife came out. And then what really made me want to publish it was when Fifty Shades of Grey came out. <laughs> because it was so bad. <laughs> but it was so bad that it had done so well. And, and so I went ahead and did this. Um, <laughs> Convinced on the basis of the person who was talking to me, and then when I did research, because that's who I am, uh, I was further convinced that she was somebody uh, with um, not enormous intellectual power necessarily, but what she called and what I really believe was a gift for life. She was a really happy person. And everybody knows that it's hard to write a book about a really happy person. <laughs> Uh, moreover, Lawrence's critics uh, were really down on her. The rap in Lawrence's criticism is that she somehow ruined him, whereas it became clear to me that she totally made him who he was, and that part of the battle between them was the same battle that Fitzgerald had with Zelda. Uh, where was the creative energy coming from? Is that him? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Because you said Frida made him. Rita made him do the dishes. <laughs> well, then he liked to do the dishes. Okay, oh, you're right. <laughs> okay, all right. So, um, so this, so this, this book begins uh, with a little prologue, and I'm going to read from the prologue, and then I'm going to go into the scene where they meet, and the meeting between them is about as improbable as anything else. And when I get to that section. Uh, if I was going to read more, it goes back in time and explains that they have had a very intense conversation before her husband comes home. This is the prologue. Is she you? Is Lady Chatterley based on you, they asked? People say you fought a lot. Were you happy with him, Mrs. Lawrence? And was he happy with you? Were you in love? like Lady C and her gamekeeper. At New York's Pennsylvania station, light visible ahead and my hand on the rail to board the train, I considered my reply. 
In the novel, Connie Chatterley is a ruddy English lass, rosy skin, deep blue eyes, her father an artist in the Royal Academy. She's Rosalind Baines, though like all my husband's women, she has a lot of me in her too. But mostly she's Rosalind of the Terrace in Firenze, and the figs, that's a poem, and the hut in the meadow, and the Jane Thomas, the John Thomas and the Lady Jane. I knew that, and it wounded me still. But who else could say for sure? So when the reporters asked about the notorious Lady Chatterley, I saw my chance, and I took it. I breathed deeply and said, didn't my husband always write about me? Didn't Connie spend her youth in Germany? Didn't she take a chance by leaving a respectful husband to follow her great love, a man from the working class? Who else could she be? Couples fight, but quarrels don't affect true marriage. The reporters wanted a simple story, so I gave them one. The truth, well, like me, the truth was more complex. So this is where they meet, and just as a little bit of background, uh, Frida was born in Metz, um, which was then Germany, uh, when Alsace Lorraine was ruled by Germany. Uh, she was a baroness, the daughter of the, the German governor general of the Alsace Lorraine. Uh, she married um, an Englishman who was considerably older than her because she thought that she would be educated when she came to England. He turned out to be boring and dull, but though he does have certain sexual skills that I endow him with uh, <laughs> in, in, in this book. Uh, she, she quickly begins to wander. She's a very, very uh, sensual woman. She quickly begins to wander. And the love of her life, possibly greater than D.H. Lawrence, was a psychologist named Otto Gross. This is true. And Otto Gross was a renegade psychiatrist who devoutly believed that in the great mother. And Frida absorbed that from him. So now what you have to imagine is a woman living in Nottingham, married to a dull man, mother of three children, quite in love with her children, who has all of this stuff going on in her head, all of this stuff going on in her head. And she meets the H. Lawrence, and this is where the novel starts. It felt forbidden, as though he was really a boy when I met him, and not a man of 26. He followed me around the room with deep-set hypnotic eyes as I served coffee and cooking, the apple cake my maid Ida favored. I heard the children in the next room playing with a top that their father had bought in Cambridge. I grasped the coffee pot firmly with one hand and the table with the other, afraid that the, afraid that the heat from his eyes might steam the windows and give us both away. It was an unlikely turn to my husband's student's visit. A young genius, my husband Ernest called him, a real writer and published the first he had ever had in class. Does he know I translate poetry, I asked eagerly. He won't care, Frida, my husband replied. Now, with a drumming in my ears, I raised my head as I served coffee and met the gaze from my guest's eyes. Could he sense my thoughts? This man, so intense and so strange, what did he want of me? What would he do to my home and to my life? Ernest bit into his cake, swallowing quickly, as he continued to speak of art, beauty, and the exaltation of poetry, Shakespeare, Goethe, Nietzsche. But the conversation felt like a dodge and a distraction from the main affair, which I knew would be between, this, between me and this new and marvelous man. Ernest is large and handsome, manly, manly. I have nothing to be ashamed of in him. But Lawrence's body radiates charm and seems in motion even when he's sitting still, and those eyes like a panther transfixing its prey. When Ernest went to his study to get more books, my guest's eyes tracked me from the table to the sideboard as I neatened up, piercing my high-colored gray dress to my bright-colored scarlet soul. A rich, deep blue beneath ginger-colored hair, they took in my home, my husband, my children, my life. You barely notice him, you know. Never look at him, never hear him, never think of him. Though he's the father of your children, you're scarcely aware that he exists, he said. Just like that, as soon as my husband left the room. Please do stop clutching that coffee pot like it's attached to your hands and sit down close to me while you can, so that we can enjoy the moment and continue our conversation. But what 
what do you mean, I replied uneasily, putting down the pot and sitting nonetheless. I mean simply what I say, Mrs. Weekly. You're scarcely aware that your husband exists. You're in a daze, a sleeping beauty, and should know it if you don't already. Your husband doesn't care about your mind or your ambitions, and I do. That's a difference you might ponder. I looked at our guest and wondered if he could be right. Was he the man who could appreciate the woman I was, the woman I longed to be? Then, when I heard Ernest returning, I leapt up almost guiltily and asked, more coffee? <laughs> um, so I kind of realized as, as, as I was writing that and as I, as, I was, as I was reading it that I'm kind of very interested in, um, and I guess I'm really interested in this, um, in the kind of push and pull that women feel in life, like on the one hand the, the desire to please and, and, and to fit in, and on the other hand to be assertive. And, and Frida very much ha has that. Um, I, I wanted in this book to capture some of the idyllic moments between them. And the difficulty, well, there, was, there were many difficulties. One of the difficulties was that I knew a lot about D.H. Lawrence, and I had to forget some of what I knew as I was writing. But then the second thing was that um, these are extremely articulate people, and their letters are wonderful, and their, their memoirs are wonderful. And so occasionally I'd find myself lifting a phrase, and obviously I'm not a plagiarist, so I would italicize it. There are three italicized phrases in what I just read you. Uh, but then the larger problem was in chapters where uh, he was creating and she was trying to participate in the creation. How was I going to work in his actual words? And so I'm, I'm going to do that in this passage, which is early in their relationship, uh, when things are still pretty honky-dory. And if you know Lawrence, you might recognize, um, or you probably will recognize what's being created. When I was small, he said, rocking me gently on his lap as we watched the sunset from our terrace, I'd hide under the booming strings of the piano holding mother's feet. I'd let them guide my hands up and down and feel safe, surrounded by the noise. When my parents fought, I'd dash onto the instrument, looking for comfort. But she wouldn't be there, of course, too busy fighting with my dad. He smiled bitterly, <coughs> genitis, inflammation of the parents. <laughs> I could see it. His parents' home in Drury Eastwood, the coal mine of Farba smeared with dust and drink, the anguished mother pouring out abuse and hoarding shillings so that her children could have an education. They'd fight in the kitchen cheek by jowl with other minor sooty brick houses. It was all so raw and basic, with the children listening and in pain, ugly, yes, and common but universal too. You should explore your feelings, I said to him as I turned to kiss his cheek. I love the way you portray the son's emotions toward his mother. It's true and brave, and you should read some Freud. Little birdie, I thought, mother's darling and father's object of scorn. Yes, he said, but not now. As dusk falls, I'd like for you to sing to me. He kissed me deeply and nuzzled the mounds of my breast before releasing me gently from his lap to the piano just inside the door. With the soft Italian air around us, I sang Schubert Lieder from the Vinterisa, sad music that suited my worries about my children. Then I burst strongly into song at the end, my voice matching the piano, as the singer should. He sat with his forehead in his hands, listening intently, then took his notebook and began to write. When he looked up and signaled with his palm to me, I stopped and listened as his voice replaced mine. Softly in the dusk, a woman is singing to me, taking me back down the vista of years till I see a child sitting under the piano in the sound of the tinkling strings and pressing the small, poised feet of a mother who smiles as she sings. Good. In fact, really lovely. I'd suggest that you change sound to boom, since the echo of the instrument surrounds and overwhelms the boy. It, it's better, yes, more vivid. I, you're right. Thanks, Frida. You have a wonderful ear for poetry. Boom it is. I'll need two more stanzas, though, to complete the form. If you leave me for a bit, I'd like to do them now, he said as he lit some candles. Darkness had fully fallen over the lake when, with a falsely nonchalant air, Lawrence came into the sitting room where I had been doing needlepoint by lamplight. He thrust two papers at me, saying curtly, read them. I put my needle through the fabric and lit a cigarette while Lawrence retreated to the terrace. Between her breasts is my home, between her breasts, 
three sides set on me space in fear, but the fourth side's rest warm in a city of strength between her breasts. When I got this far, by the way, that, that is a poem, it was so bad I couldn't bear but repeat the first couple of times. Uh, when I got this far, I felt 16 again and in love. When Carl kissed my palm, I thought joyfully, yes, now you are a woman. Lawrence's words made me think also joyfully, yes, now you are immortal. And I felt sure that I had been right to do anything, to even leave my beloved children to be with this man. Poems last, suffering does not. Children age, poems remain eternal. And when they were older, my children would appreciate our link to immortality. For there I stood in the words of Lawrence's poem, hovering powerful like the dark lady in Shakespeare's sonnets. I hugged my breast, thinking of them as a city of strength in a hostile world. I kissed the paper, lit another cigarette, and eagerly turned to the other page. Softly in the dusk, a woman is singing to me, taking me down the vista of years till I see a child sitting under the piano in the boom of the tinkling strings and pressing the small, poised feet of a mother who smiles as she sings. In spite of myself, the old, insidious mastery of song betrays me back till the heart of me weeps to belong to the old Sunday evenings at home with winter outside and hymns in the cozy parlor, the tinkling piano our guide. So now it is vain for the singer to burst into clamor with the great black, black piano appassionato. The glamour of childish days is upon me. My manhood is cast down in the flood of remembrance. I weep like a child for the past. His mother's poem, I felt, as I exchanged my cigarette, and a great one. It had not turned out exactly as I might wish. My lover, like my children, wept for the past. But talking with me had loosed Lawrence's memory. I felt like a collaborator, a fellow poet, an Orpheus who rescues love for the grave, the deep, dark, eternal love for the mother, a poet in a way myself. I put my green shawl around my shoulders, went out on the terrace, and found Lawrence pretending to look at Lago di Gabda, one of the beautiful green or blue places we always chose. It was too dark to see more than shadows, but he had his feet up on the railing and his head tossed back, drinking in the rich Italian air, trying to look casual, though I could tell he wanted to hear what I thought. Lar, I said, using a pet name. His eyes locked on mine, seeking a clue to how I liked his new poems, the first he had written since we had left Metz. Lovely, just lovely. Your lines are real and true, attuned to the body and its feelings, a real strength for you as a writer. Wagner, Hardy, and Whitman, for he admired Whitman, would approve, as I do. I, he said, gesturing to me softly as I returned to his lap and nestled there. You touch the quick of life and death for me. You're the finest woman in all of England, or Italy, or Germany, or wherever we happen to be, he laughed. My undine Nixie, my earthly goddess, my queen bee. Women and lovers, you should call your novel, I teased. Nay, sons are the lovers in this book, but I'm the lover here. He replied, reaching out to me and using his full Midlands accent, a language of relaxation and play. And as in Dante, we read no more that day. Uh -huh. <laughs> I stop? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I, I was wondering whether the applause was a signal stop. Rita would not let you stop. Okay, well, three won't let me stop. Uh, I'm going to just read two other pieces from this and then something short from um, um, an older book, which is going to be leading to a newer book. Um, uh, again, if you know the story of, of Lawrence's life, he, he, he's always been fairly sickly and very bad health. And not that long into their marriage, he becomes quite ill um, and with recurring bronchitis, which turns out to be tuberculosis. And one of the things that is usually not written about, but that's the kind of writer I am, and that's the kind of critic I am, too. Uh, I mean, you have to think about the fact that, that he must have been impotent, you know, fairly, fairly often, uh, and then with increasing frequency um, as, as, as their marriage developed, and she was a very, very sensual woman. So um, how does that work? Well, one of the things that, that, that happens is she stays with him absolutely to the end. There's no question but that she'll see him uh, for, through his illness. Uh, she has no problem with that. But it's part of the economy of their marriage that there are repeated infidelities. But toward the end of their, of, of their lives together, she becomes his business manager by default. 
and uh, uh, very much toward the end of his life. Uh, he's, he's, he's given an art exhibition in, in Manchester, it looks like it's going to be great, and the authorities um, confiscate the paintings um, because of the display of pubic hair. Any painting which hints at pubic hair is confiscated. And I just have, this is a very short little rant at the beginning of the chapter called The Phrase of Pubic Hair. <laughs> if I could, I would show you right here on this page my pubic hair, draping my genitals discreetly with my woman's body as good as any man's and better because it has given birth. Marking the center of my universe and of Lawrence's, not because either of us was so very much obsessed with sex, but because we know what sex means. It's the life force of the universe beaming through us and the animals through the stones, through the desert, trying to unite what severed one so far back that no one knows. When the male divided from the female, the light from the dark, the yin from the yang, Isis from Osiris, Shiva from Shakti, two halves of one whole seeking to reunite ever since. The sun and the moon, Blake Zoe's in emanations, the force that even Mabel feels and that the red Indians sing and dance in their pueblos the same force that St. Francis wrote about in his poetry, and Lawrence does too. The British, those canai, the dogs, they never understood this, but when we do, it is why Lawrence writes and paints and the philosophy I live by. Yeah. <laughs> um, the last thing I'll read from this, um, and then I just want to, want to read something from a different kind of writing that I also do. Um, um, uh, Lawrence dies um, uh, quite young, and um, uh, this, is, this is the death scene. Uh, it's, it's now 1930, the last year of his life. There's a good sanitarium in Vance, the doctors had said. So in 1930, we moved to Vance. Our friends, Aldous Huxley and his wife Maria, lived close by, and my daughter Barbie came to help, since Lawrence required almost constant nursing. Vance was too far for Angela, her lover, whom she would later marry, to visit. The last day in February, the doctors suggested that I commit Lawrence to the sanitarium, and desperate for help, I did, but just for one night. Why should he listen to the cries of others dying in pain? On March 1st, as the taxi bounced over the cobblestones to take him home, my husband moaned, but he smiled weakly and whispered, thank you, Frida, as I put him to bed and unlaced his shoes. The next morning, when Aldous and Barbie asked how Lawrence had spent the night, I straightened up on the chair next to his bed and replied, it was terrible, he was in so much pain he couldn't sleep, perhaps I had done the wrong thing. My husband shook his head but moaned. We'll find a doctor, Barbie promised, an edge of panic in her voice. There must be one, even this early, in the center of the town or at the sanitarium. Or at least we'll bring some morphia, added the pragmatic Aldous. We'll be back soon, Lawrence, he said in an encouraging voice, and they left. I washed my face in a basin and combed my hair and did the best for Lawrence that I could. As I wiped his face softly with towel, he croaked out, Don't go, Frida. I am here, and here I stay, Lorenzo. Just relax and be as easy as you can, I murmured as I leant over him. Should I read to you? Garrett sent the proofs of your last poems. Perhaps you'd like to hear them. He opened, his open, he opened eyes that had the abstracted, faraway look of those bound soon for another world. But he nodded, and I took that as my cue. My voice choked up as I read. The flood subsides, and the body, like a worn seashell, emerges strange and lovely, and the little ship wings home, faltering and lapsing on the pink flood, and the pale soul steps out into her house again, filling the heart with peace. I, he whispered, ship of death, that's a poem. I'm dying, Frida. We are all of us dying every day we live. I hope that your time is not quite yet, I replied. He smiled thinly and closed his eyes, and I held his hand, which was young and smooth-looking still. He was just 45, though the skin was paper-thin, so that his veins showed through. I watched the rise and fall of his chest until, after about an hour, his breathing slowed, but also seemed quite labored. Lar, I said, whispering and afraid to shake him or do more than hold his hand. Can you hear me? Say something, if you can. A silence. Then press my hand twice, if you can. He pressed my hand twice. I love you, my darling, I murmured. Though there have been others, there has never been anyone but you. Two presses back. The noise in his chest grew louder. Can you press my hand again, Lorenzo? Can you still hear me? Two presses. 
Are you in pain? Two presses again. Still holding his hand, I turn to look at the clock, feeling panicky and grieved. Aldous and Huxley have gone to fetch a doctor, or at least some morphia, I said as soothingly as I could. They should be back soon, a single press. Lawrence, I whispered, can you still hear me? Though I felt only faint pressure, I continued to speak to him aloud, but also began to chant to myself again and again, depart his soul and priest, though I'm not a religious woman. After about 20 minutes, the gurgling in his lungs became ferocious, almost like speech. My God, it's the death rattle, I thought, looking around for help that was not there. Suddenly, blood poured from his mouth, after which he remained deathly still, and I realized it was over, though I heard myself ask again and again, against all reason, even as I withdrew my hand from his, Lawrence, Lorenzo, are you still with me? I think I'll stop there. I think it's kind of interesting to get a little taste of what's going on. I've written another novel. I'm not sure what I need to do with it. If there are any publishers out there who want, to, want to know more about it, I'd be happy to talk about it. Uh, but I've, I'm also starting on a book of essays about um, uh, the family in the later stages of a family's existence. And um, that is going to begin uh, with what is the last chapter in a book I wrote called Cross of Ocean Parkway, uh, which is part memoir and part critical. And I'd like to read just a little bit of an essay about my father. Um, I, I started writing this, in, and again, you're writers, so you'll understand this in a compulsive way, when I, when I knew that he had lung cancer and, and was dying, and I would pull over guiltily, you know, and pull out a piece of paper and write things down and not tell anyone in my family that I was doing this. Uh, but um, this is an essay called um, Crossing Back um, in, the, in the Other Direction. And it's from my father, Salvatore de Marco, Sr., 1912 to 1992. When I was a child, I thought of my father as connected to the larger world, the glittering city. Every day, my tall, slim father, dressed in a dark suit and tie, combed his brown hair with a pronounced part to the side, groomed his thin Don Amici mustache, and headed for the city, a Rudolph Valentino, very Italian. My father knew the city, and it was a point of pride for him. The king of New York, my husband called him recently. My father was born in Manhattan on the Lower East Side, and the New York of his youth was his private heartland. He boasted about having been rough in school and being kicked out in the eighth grade after a fight in which his nose was broken into an exaggerated Roman beak. He would tell that story again and again how he was expelled. Bored with it, my mother would murmur with vague disapproval. Oh yeah, a tough guy. For most of the years I was growing up, my father had a job that put him in touch with the city. He was a messenger for a large bank First National City, now Citibank. Actually, he was what was called an armed guard, delivering stocks, bonds, and cash from office to office, and for a while collecting payments in Harlem with a black partner he liked named Oscar Joseph. Later, he worked in the mailroom of an insurance company, and he liked this job, too. But my father loved best his bank job, and the gun he carried as an armed messenger added a certain jauntiness to his image. <coughs> At the bank, the city was his beat. It was the equivalent of the police route he always coveted but couldn't get. My father was six feet tall, unusual among second generation Sicilian Americans, but he was too thin for his height to pass the physical examination for the police department. He took the physical three times. It was part of family lore that he gulped malted several times a day before the last examination. But although he always had a heavy, hearty appetite, he just couldn't gain enough weight, and it was a profound disappointment. All his life, my father would say of certain acquaintances with admiration and a kind of hush in his voice, he's a cop. He kept track of raises in policemen's pay scales. He loved detective shows on TV. I think he always felt he had missed out on a certain level of excitement, missed out as well on the financial security of being a policeman for the city. Still, 
at the bank. Manhattan was his beat, and he took personal responsibility for knowing it. My father could reel off the exact location of everything, hotels, movie theaters, even stores and restaurants. He knew the subway and bus routes by heart. He never wanted to leave New York and would tell people again and again when he visited us in North Carolina that he was a New Yorker and that outside of New York everything was boring. Later in life, after he retired and stopped going into Manhattan regularly, one of his most annoying habits was constantly giving directions to places that had changed, especially driving directions, since he never drove. But when I was young, my father's intimacy with the city was his special charm. He took me on excursions that must have been on his vacations, since my mother was never there and was probably working. We went to out-of-the-way museums, like the Museum of the City of New York, to zoos and parks for sledding, to Wall Street, where he worked, to Radio City Music Hall or the old Roxy, every birthday to see the movie and to stage shows. These were places that made me feel the pulse of life beyond Brooklyn, and my father was at first the key. My father smoked exactly a pack of day between the ages of 10 and 60, and then gave up cigarettes, cold turkey, as firmly and definitely as he gave up reading when he had to wear glasses. He also never ate cake after dinner, just at breakfast, and never used more than one slice of cold cuts in his sandwiches. He was a man with many rules, some of them nonsensical, which he would proclaim repeatedly as simple matters of fact. No, nope, I don't eat cake at night, or that's right, just one slice of provolone. <coughs> as he aged, I saw the rigidity in his life, but forgot the younger man, the reader, the adventurer who took me all over town. I needed to forget in order to become myself. For adolescents need rebellion, female adolescents in Bensonhurst needed even more. Now I am free to remember. The very last section is short. <coughs> when a parent dies, you are freed from images of the last few years, from the physical form in which you knew them then. Until a few months before he died, my father was a handsome man of 80, with abundant silver hair still mixed with black, tall and slim and elegant. His hair would jut forward over his forehead while he worked, making him look almost boyish. He had relatively few wrinkles. The only real signs of his advanced age were his thick glasses and an occasional wobble from an inner ear condition. He was always neatly dressed and never really informal. He always wore polished or suede shoes and <coughs> sneakers, even to take long daily walks. But now, in my imagination, my father has floated free of the physical images from his last years. He is the dark-haired, slim man, almost always wearing a dark suit from the photographs. My father on the subway, holding the straps, teaching me the ropes of going into the city. My father flying kites at my cousin's country house, helping me chase a kite down a road for miles and miles. I remember still how that kite looked, finally wrapped in some telephone wires as we turned and walked away. I remember the gold tooth he hasn't had since his late 50s, when he got false teeth. There it is in my mind. It's as much a part of my father now as anything else. Then, as I am waking up one morning, I see my 80-year-old father on the inside of my eyelids, his beak nose, his thin mustache, his crooked smile. He starts to speak, but it's too late. I'm fully awake. It's so vivid that I need a few seconds to remind myself that he is recently dead. When a parent dies, you also cross from one state to another. All my life, I had defined myself by rebellion against Bensonhurst, but the grounds for rebellion are running out. Thank you.